Okay. So it's a 30 year old man presenting with uh, low energy, obesity, and uh, gynecomastia. Go for it, go for it. I went first last time. <laughs> you got it. Um, this is, um, oy, okay. 30 year old man with low energy, obesity and gynecomastia. Where does the story begin? Um, I'll tell you that it's not uncommon to, um, uh, to take these, the, these complaints and to try to study where you're going to um, drop your anchor. And I think that um, where we choose to drop our anchor is a complicated subject that has many dimensions to it. But I would say the first is um, two common things, obesity and low energy are often unexplained by specific diagnoses. But gynecomastia in stark contrast is actually fairly different. Gynecomastia in a man might um, lead to very specific pathology in contrast to low energy and obesity. Um, is that always true? No, not necessarily. Um, a large fraction of gynecomastia is unexplained. So we may end up in real life with this case saying, hey, this is a 38-year-old man who has unexplained obesity, gynecomastia, and low energy. Um, but what gives us pause and gives us something to work on is the gynecomastia itself, which um, fundamentally represents an excess of estrogen over testosterone. Um, and that's the key question is why is the estrogen elevated in comparison to the testosterone? Um, after you realize and you anchor yourself in that basic principle, the key question becomes, is it a gonadal source of excess estrogen or deficiency in testosterone, or is it an extra gonadal source? And in all comers, extra gonadal disease accounts for the majority of identifiable causes of gynecomastia. And that's patients with liver disease, kidney disease. Um, that's patients who have medications like spironolactone, toxins like marijuana. Um, and so I think the way you'd be approaching this is you would look for those things. If there's liver disease, kidney disease, thyroid disease, and the medications, and then ask yourself, is there a reason to work this patient up? Because you may just stop at those things and say, this is idiopathic gynecomastia, or you may say, hey, there are additional features of gonadal causes of either testosterone deficiency or estrogen ex excess uh, to pursue the workup. So that's where I'd be at. And I'm curious, Shami, what, what you would layer on to that. I love that uh, approach, Robbie. Um, yeah, I think like medications, toxins, I think about first. And the other one, like metabolic causes, like cirrhosis is another uh, one that comes to mind. I do have a question for you. Uh, like opioids, um, can you uh, remind me of the pathophysiology of how it causes gynecomastia? Is that reduce the testosterone? Is that gonadal or is it another way that it does it? We have the world's expert in my opinion. Yeah, Tiago, teach me. It is the metabolization of estradiol by the hepatocytes. Yeah, um, perfect. Thank you, Tiago. Um, it's just the best feeling ever to be surrounded by people who can teach you all the things. Um, yeah, and I think you know, I would be curious going forward whether it, um, if there's more like other systemic signs that points us to more like metabolic diseases versus like medication. So it would be really cool to see what you found out, Tiago. Okay, so for 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 liver disease, you can't metabolize estradiol, so estradiol is high, so that's the reason you have gynecomastia and all of those things. Uh, for this case, he did not notice difference in his puberty compared to others, and uh, his low energy, I asked him more data about it, and uh, he said he feels he gets more tired than usual while working. So he works in a garment, He's a garment worker, and uh, he said his peers, they have a performance that's much better than, than his performance, and uh, he do not exercise himself. Regarding the gynecomastia, he told me it was not painful, not enlarging over time, and uh, he told his, he has ever had it, but um, he wants to know why. 
Yeah, he has that gynecomastia. He had that gynecomastia. Uh, there is a progressive weight gain since adolescence. Uh, he didn't use medications. His parents were alive and healthy, and uh, he had one, and he has one younger brother that is healthy. Do you want me to give you the physical exam or? Okay. Um. Uh, so for the physical exam, blood pressure normal 120 over 70, heart rate 78, height 100, uh, uh, 107 centimeters, weight 108 kilograms, BMI 30.9. Uh, for cardiovascular, abdominal, pulmonary, everything is normal, thyroid normal. For the gynecomastia, it's a true gynecomastia. I mean, you can feel the glands, it's bilateral, and it has approximately 2.5 over one centimeter. For the testicles, the higher diameter, was 2.4 centimeters. And I know you are not used to it. So the average is four centimeters. And after, and it's a marker of puberty in men. And uh, we consider the puberty started once the, the, the testicles are over 2.5 centimeters or four milliliters. So it's like pre-puberty pre testicles. Also, a small penis. There is a table for penis, believe me. And uh, his penis size was 4.7 centimeters, and then the average is 10 centimeters. Uh, so I think that's it for the physical exam. Thank you so much, Tiago, for presenting this case. Uh, so I'll just like have tackle some of the HBA and then leave some of the exam to RG. Uh, I feel like uh, one thing that is really helpful here is just kind of figuring out the time course, right? If this is something like more acutely, it seems like it's been going on for a while for this uh, patient in particularly, um, and that now he's like representing to care. It seems like his sim uh, symptoms of fatigue and everything is going on, uh, is getting worse. However, the gynecomastia is something that has been uh, present, which kind of like uh, given his age makes me a little bit, and especially with the physical exam finding, making me worried more about the gonadal causes right like the extra gonadal causes like the medication the metabolic causes toxins we wouldn't uh, expect to find a gonadal pathology on um, our exam so um, thinking about like kind of like gonadal um, causes which is again as Robbie mentioned is more rare whether this is like a decreased testosterone or increased estrogen I think is that kind of the questions to uh, ask ourselves and uh, the ones that, ooh, I love this. <laughs> I love this. Thank you so much for uh, putting this up. The one thing that also um, that can cause decreased testosterone in someone is kind of like prolactinomas as well. That's um, or something in addition to the opiates that we talked about previously that catches my eyes. And then kind of like with your increased estrogen um, and with like kind of someone with the gynecomastia that you can see as well, thinking about any tumors, um, issues with aromatase, I feel like can also do it um, as well. So uh, I think like now, like uh, uh, Robbie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm more concerned about like kind of like one adult pathologies um, by please, uh, what do you think? Oh, cruising, so, so good. Um, I completely agree with you. I think that, you know, the landscape that Tiago is, is painting both with the, um, I don't know if people paint landscapes. And I just can make, make that up. No, I, love way, that. I, have to, I have to acknowledge, I'm, I'm like an old soul and 2.15 p.m. Pacific time, which is the time for me is, there's two things wrong with it. One is it's like 10 hours into my day. So I'm tired. And two, I just had a delicious pasta for lunch. So I'm like very sleepy. So I guarantee you that I'm more lethargic than this patient coming in for sure. But um, your analysis has sparked, um, uh, your accurate analysis has uh, reinvigorated me. Um, as has this grapefruit Waterloo, which I also highly recommend with your pasta. Um, but that, um, that is not what we're talking about today. Uh, 
we're talking about gonadal causes of gynecomastia. And the reason I think we can focus on gonadal is exactly what you said with the history and then the exam. The exam localizes um, to the gonadal causes because we see a deficiency in the anatomic um, uh, uh, gonadal glands. We see that the testes are both and the penis size are small. Now, I actually have a knowledge gap because I would assume that that tells us that there's something wrong with the gonads themselves as a primary testicular problem, but it may also represent a, pitu hypo a long standing hypo hypothalamic pituitary problem. So, I, I would, my instinct tells me that we know it's gonadal, but I think. Um, uh, high confidence as you have that it's gonadal. Instinct tells me that within the gonads, it's probably testicular based on the testicular size, but I don't know if long-standing hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction can also lead to atrophy of the testicle. Mm. And uh, so I would leave that to the expertise of Tiago. But I think as you're trying to make progress now and say you don't know, it's like say you are the internist taking care of this patient and you don't have your endocrinologist handy right there um, on the screen with you, like how would you make progress? I think in these instances, um, knowing the height is really important because the most common um, genetic cause for gonadal failure is Klinefelter syndrome. And those patients usually are fairly tall, have a, a, a long arm span um, and have um, subtle, um, but certainly present neuropsychiatric features. So if you notice a mood disturbance as you talk to the patient, or you notice that they might be slower than you expect them to, that you might say, oh, I wonder if this is Klinefelter's, which is a primary testicular issue. You might also check, this is the one time in clinic where you might consider checking uh, the, uh, uh, the visual fields because a pituitary issue might, be, might show up that way. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you might also be anchored in some practical things. And the practical thing is to recognize that obesity can also cause central hypogonadism. Um, and so um, I think the next question, the next step is to confirm your hypothesis that it's gonadal with testosterone and maybe estrogen levels. And then to be careful not to assume that a gonadal lesion is in the testes, but maybe hypothalamic where FSH and LH levels might be helpful. But I'd love for Tiago, can you comment on that? Like, does the size of the gonad localize to, is it a testicular or pituitary problem or can it be both? So you are brilliant, Fabi, and I'm not, I'm not kidding. I mean, you are completely yeah. right. So testicles are not working. It can be a problem in the, the testicles themselves, or it can be that you don't have FSH, you don't have LH, so it will not uh, develop. So you're completely right. We cannot look, we can say that there is a problem in the gonad, as you said, but the etiology is not possible uh, to, to know now. I completely agree with you. I have nothing to add, zero. So for the exams, uh, hemoglobin 13.3, hematocrit 40, leuco, leucocytes 5,680, platelets 278,000, AST 29, ALT 24, creatinine 0 0.9, if I'm, I'm talking fast, then I can just copy and paste because I'm just getting it here right now. So I'm not seeing Gabriel. Uh, TSH 2.4, free T4 1.4, prolactin 12, and it's normal. HCG less than two, and it's normal. Stradiol 10, it's normal. Testosterone 180, and it's not normal, it's low, normal being higher than 300. FSH 16.4 and normal 1.5 to 12.5, so it's high. LH 13.2, normal being 0 0.7 to 7.9, so it's high, FSH and LH are high. And a breast ultrasound confirmed through gynecomastia. 2.3 by 1.2 centimeters in the left side and 2.6 by 1 centimeter in the right side. And I think that's it. Let me know if I have to, if I need to repeat something. Uh, Tiago, I think I didn't get a FSH. Can you repeat that for me? 
FSH 16.4, and you. it's high. The upper normal limit is 12.5. Oy, the story gets really, really intriguing. And I think Charmin's suspicion of gonadal caused basically confirmed with the testosterone being low. And if you're analyzing why the testosterone can be low, I think you have to anchor yourself in basic principles. Um, all endocrine is studying the organ in question and the command organ. And the command organ is the pituitary. It is the queen of endocrine diseases. And so here we're saying that the test, the, the hormone is low, but the pituitary is functioning very well. In fact, the pituitary is trying to compensate for the gonadal dysfunction. So we've localized the problem, not to the pituitary, because it is trying to overcome primary testicular disease. And so I think that now we've gone from gonadal pituitary to pituitary versus testicular to being it being a primary testicular issue. And um, I'll leave it there and, and pass the mic to Charmin to see what reflex. This is not a space that we commonly think about in, if at all, actually, to be honest, as especially as adult doctors. But this is the point. This is the role of clinical reasoning. Like, what can we guess, infer? Like, what could, what would we look up? And so I'll pass the mic to Charmin to tell us to share her wisdom. And, um, and but I'm not the least bit surprised this a case ends up in Tiago's office. Yes, exactly. I'm grateful for our endocrinologist colleague because honestly, like I haven't thought about this in a long time. So this is actually awesome. Um, I had similar um, reaction to you that like that low testosterone, then the question becomes why is the testosterone low uh, when uh, if we assume that our pituitary gland is functioning well. And I, in uh, the cases that I've always heard is like mostly like, you know, in my world are um, like um, ex either ex someone who's like um, had like exogenous testosterone uh, for whatever reason that has suppressed it maybe, or like, um, again, like, um, specific uh, like a medication side effects. So I my differential is quite limited um, to be honest with you. So this is something that I would like honestly just pull up up to date and start reading uh, about it because I, I don't know. Oh, RG, help me out. What are your thoughts? Can I tell you a story? Mm -hmm. um, this is published. It's one of my favorite experiences in clinic. I had a patient referred, I was at, uh, you know, this, I was at, at, I'm actually still wearing the, the jacket from it. I was at the general, <laughs> yeah. I had my clinic at the San Francisco general hospital, a, a, a hospital that uh, is a community hospital that sees patients usually mm -hmm. who have minimal or no insurance. And this patient had actually been discharged from the neurology service. And the reason he had been discharged from the neurology service is he presented with a grand mal seizure of unclear radiology. Um, he had never sought care. Mm -hmm. Um, and he described to the neurology team brief episodes of night, brief, brief, brief episodes of sweats that happened at night. And so they translated that to night sweats and did a million dollar workup. You know, he had mm. an echo, he had a PET CT, he had an ESR, CRP, had all sorts of workup. Mm. And so he was, he was essentially sent to primary care to follow up on this um, a fever of unknown origin workup. And when my attending reviewed his chart, she noticed that there was never a fever. And when we talked to him, he says these sweats would only last for seconds. Mm. And lo and behold, his mom, and during his mom is in the visit, which was intriguing to me. This was, he was 30. I was like, why is his mom in the visit? And she then describes, you know, he's had a long time and a very hard time communicating with people and basically hinted at some um, psychiatric illnesses that limited her son and had, had her have to kind of shield him from the world. And um, it also turned out that he had actually had a girlfriend for two years and was not using any protection. Both of them weren't. And um, there were, she hadn't gotten pregnant. And so um, my attending thought, wait, oh my gosh, could this be Kleinfelter syndrome? Mm. And she taught me all about it. And we actually wrote it up in the American Journal of Medicine. And um, what Kleinfelter is, Kleinfelter's is the most common um, genetic cause of primary hypogonadism, which we've localized mm. here. And it's basically when you have two X's and a Y, and that results in primary testicular fa failure and a lot of autoimmune features and a lot of other endocrinopathies. Um, and the key was to recognize that this patient was really tall. He was really, really tall. Now, I, I don't know if 190 centimeters is actually that. I think it's tallish. I don't know. But all I know about primary testicular failure is what I've heard in residency twice. One is Klinefelter syndrome. And two, we had a patient who had lupus and had oh. to get cyclophosphamide. And so I think you can get gonadal failure from chemotherapy. 
and you can get gonadal failure from Kleinfelders. That's all I know. I'm sure that there's a longer list of that, but I think um, those would be, I would review his history to see if he's gotten medications that uh, could have done this. And I think that Kleinfelters is a, is a very common, a highly underdiagnosed condition that I would look for, but I'm forgetting how we'd look for it. So I, um, I would have to look that up too. Yeah. Oh, you're so good. That brings me back. I'm like, well, yeah, Kleinfelters syndrome, med school. Oh, need to go back and review things. Oh, that was awesome, Robbie. Thank you. Tiago, tell us more. Yeah, so that's the reason I'm I'm here. So I'm really happy listening to you. I I want to know medicine this way because I know you are you work in the hospital. So I'm kind of okay. I'll bring this case, but they work in the hospital. But then you do magic because that's exactly how I, as an endocrinologist, think about it. So we have this hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. And then let's tackle, let's tackle the, the, the first case. What is the most common case? It's clinic filter. So I ordered a, uh, a karyotype and actually I scanned his karyotype without his name. So you can see it's here. Can you see my screen? Okay. So all chromosomes are here and you can see the, the number 23, 2X and 1Y. So and this is the, the real one. So it was Kleine Felter. So I think in a, in, a, in a rapid discussion like this one, it's as Rabbi said, it's the important thing to keep in mind that it's underdiagnosed situation, uh, hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, it affects sexually one in 500 men. So it's common, but you know, it, it can present with in, in, like in this guy uh, when he was 30 years old. So it was one year ago. Now he's using testosterone and, uh, and he feels much better. I think now his weight is 100.2. So he lost like eight kilograms and wow. he feels much better. And uh, he's using testosterone on the, well, on the can weight. And uh, I, I did not say, but his father is 175 centimeters and his mother is 165. So it's another clue. Uh, he is his tall compared to his parents. And I think that's it. Tiago, thank you so much for presenting this case. This is so good. And it's also like so humbling in medicine because at some point, like I learned this. And like, if you don't, it's like those muscles, if you don't use it, you lose it. And I've definitely had lost that part of that. So this is a great reminder. Can I ask you, is, this might be like a knowledge gap. Is the obesity also part of the kind of the syndrome that you see with Klein Falter? Because I always like, um, when Ravi said tall, it came back to me but obesity wasn't something that um, I thought in that like kind of limited illness script that I had. Yeah, so obesity is tricky because it can be caused by, by hypogonadism. He, he lost weight, I don't know, many reasons, but maybe one of them is because he started being treated. But also obesity can cause hypogonadism. Hypogonadism can cause obesity and Kleine Felter they have a higher weight compared to the general population. And it looks like it's not just related to the hypogonadism. Uh, their uh, life expectancy is also lower than the general population. There is no guideline for Kleine Felter, which I think it's crazy because you know it's not so uncommon. Uh, so we need to learn much, much more about it. But yes, you can expect them to be taller uh, have more obesity and uh, gynecomastia is very common. Uh, infertility is very common, as Rabbi said. So I think that's the, the script. And uh, you can diagnose then from 16 years old to 50 years old. Uh, it, it, it changed a lot and it's very well described. I think that the mean age of diagnosis is like 30 years, like this guy. So the age uh, doesn't impact uh, your process of thinking about it. That's fascinating. Okay, I'll ask one more question and then I, if the karyotype would have come back normal, then what would you, what would be your next step? 
So for the next step here, uh, as Robbie said, you have to, to, to see if there is something going on uh, with some medications, but it's unlikely given the, the genital exam. So I would look for his testicles, like a, an ultrasound, to try to understand what's going on, because probably it would be uh, something congenital, uh, mm -hmm. some problem in the, in the formation of his testicles. But you know, uh, Kleinefelter is so common. So when I asked this karyotype, I was pretty confident it would be Kleinefelter. And I, you know, there are many cases, as I said, it's common. You are awesome. Thank you so much, Diago. Ah, so good. 30 minutes of so much fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm actually like waking up now after the digestion of the pasta. And um, I, uh, it's a shame. I wish we could hang out for a whole hour, but alas, our time. I also used a word I never use, alas. I'm just, ooh, I should go. Oh, Rafa, bail me out. Always the rescue, my friend. Okay, so thank you to Chiago for the case. Another incredible one. We learned so much from you and just thank you. So we had a dissipation with obesity, low energy, and gynecomastia. And the first thing that we should think about is where should we drop our anchor? Because obesity and low energy can have a broad DGX, but gynecomastia in a man, there's a narrow DGX. So you could should drop your anchor over there. So when it comes to gynecomastia, there is excessive estrogen over testosterone, but we have to wonder why. So it could be due to two causes, gonadal or estrogonadal source of just estrogen or testosterone disbalance. So so extragonadal source is more prevalent. It could be due to liver, kidney, thyroid disease, medications like finasteride, spironolactone, but also marijuana use. And there is this pearl that Chagos Infographica has that when we have to investigate gynecomastia. So there are these few uh, items. Adult presentation, especially if it's painful, recent onset, large, if greater than 3.5 centimeters, and the history does not provide any ideology. So, but also we have to remember there are physiological the cause of gynecomastia, including newborn with mini puberty, also puberty, and in the elderly population. And then we saw that this patient had a low testosterone, and we saw it also have he also had a high FSH. So we know we knew that a pituitary was functioning, and there was a case of primary testicular disease, a primary hypogonadism. And the most common cause that we could think about was Klinefelter syndrome when there is a male with 47 chromosomes with um, XXY. And then we what, what, which clues could it think of uh, what could lead to gynecomastia uh, syndrome? Sorry, physical atrophy, tall, long extreme, extremities may present with developmental delay. There is this dysgenesis of seminiferous tubules with less in human B with increased FSH, and there is dysfunction of the lagic cells, so low testosterone with increased LH and also increased estrogen. And like Chagu showed us that the karyotype is the definitive diagnosis, and we can treat these patients with testosterone replacement. So so thank you everyone, another incredible case, another incredible discussion. I hope to see everyone tomorrow. Rafa, you were talking about leading cells. Oh, amazing. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Diego. Uh, thank you, Rafa. Thank you, Gabrielle and everybody for joining us. Bye.